Um, I am Katrina Crystal and I'm the Climate Action Officer for the City of Charlottetown. Um, many of you probably already are familiar to some degree with the project that we've been working on, um, but we are just wrapping up phase one of our climate action plan development. So that phase really involves some background research, some benchmarking for the city, um, and what we were terming pre-engagement. So talking to community members, stakeholders, city staff and council to get those foundational perspectives on how we approach this work. Um, so I, I'm joined tonight by Jade Schofield and Christina Schwantes, who are two consultants that we have been working with on this project, and they will walk you through the ins and outs of what we have found through this phase. Um, however, at the end, there will be a question and answer period, and you are more than welcome to direct questions to myself or to Christina and Jade. Uh, there is a chat feature uh, in the meeting. You're welcome to put your questions there, or at the end, you can unmute and ask us um, any questions that you may have. Um, we will ask that you keep yourself muted just through the presentation so that it doesn't get too noisy. Um, and I will also note that we will be recording tonight's session. So um, if you do want to shut off your camera accordingly, feel free um, or feel free to leave it on as well. We would love to see your faces. Um, but yeah, that's really all from me for now. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Jade and Christina. Thanks, Katrina. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for your interest and excitement in uh, phase one of Charlottetown's Climate Action Plan. Uh, I'm Jade Schofield, and both myself and Christina will be walking you through uh, the work that has been completed so far. And there will be an opportunity for a Q&A at the end. So if you're someone that needs to take notes, grab a pen and, and write down your questions or feel free to, to pop them in the chat and we will certainly get to them accordingly. But I would like to kick things off with a land acknowledgement. We are, um, you know, Prince Edward Island is located within Mark Mi'kmaq uh, and ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And they have occupied this island for over 12,000 years. And may we, through today's discussion, honor the treaties of peace and friendship, which recognize Mi'kmaq rights and establish an ongoing relationships between nations. We are all treaty people. And I'd like to take it a little bit further than just recognizing the lands in which we are talking about this evening, but encourage you to take some time to learn a little bit more around the ancestral and unceded territory in which we are all located on. Um, and there's a great tool available for you called the Native Land Tool. And it uh, you can click on it and the link can be made available in the chat. You can see a little bit more around the treaty um, borders, you can learn a bit about the language and the history and how the treaties were signed, um, which is really important for understanding and recognizing some steps towards reconciliation. But most specifically this evening, um, I also want to highlight that tonight's topic really does provide an opportunity to so support reconciliation with First Nations, Inuit and Métis across Turtle Island, which is now known as Canada. Climate resiliency has a long standing history as it relates to the lands in which we occupy and work meaningfully with First Nations, and they hold ex exceptional knowledge, understanding the patterns and responses to historical and current climate events. And it is possible through meaningful and proactive engagement to leverage this knowledge to inform action that allows us to address past and present injustice allowing us to move closer to reconciliation. So as we walk through today's discussion, I hope you can keep that in mind. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Christina, who will walk us through the first portion of tonight's presentation. Thanks so much, Jade and Katrina. Okay. So we're going to be talking about a project that we did that we're calling the discovery phase of the city of Charlottetown's climate action plan. So in the discovery phase, we're really treating this as the, the pre-work that happens before developing the climate action plan, which is phase two. So there is no plan yet. Um, the purpose of the discovery phase was 
to start understanding how climate change is affecting the community, uh, existing stressors in the community, um, start gathering information on what types of climate action is already underway. And the work done in phase one discovery is going to inform some of the themes and guiding principles and the approaches to community and partner engagement that the city uses for developing its climate action plan in phase two. So tonight we're going to focus on uh, the outcomes of just phase one, the, the discovery phase, which is where we're at uh, in the three phases. So our agenda for this evening will provide a bit of a background on what the discovery phase included, um, including some kind of findings and how those findings have informed some recommendations and next steps for the climate action plan. So just a bit of background. Um, Charlottetown's climate is changing already. Examples of climate change impacts that we've already seen are increasing temperatures, flooding, sea level rise, and coastal erosion. And those are just some examples of how climate related impacts could influence the community's health and well being, environment, and the economy. And we know that climate change affects everybody, but that the impacts are not always felt equally across communities. Often climate impacts are disproportionately worse for communities or groups that are already vulnerable due to systemic inequities. So in 2019, uh, the city declared a climate emergency alongside hundreds of other municipalities and has conducted a lot of important work over the last few years on climate change, such as a climate risk and resilience assessment report and some other programs. And now beginning to think about creating its climate action plan. The climate action plan is intended to help the community build climate resilience to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather while also reducing contribution to global climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So the discovery phase happened in three kind of main tasks, some background research, some engagement, and then those two pieces culminated in a report where we took the results from the background study and the policy scan and the results from the engagement and brought those together in that final report to inform on some potential themes and guiding principles for the climate action plan. So we'll walk through some of the results of those tasks. The first piece was the completion of a jurisdictional scan where we looked at existing plans and programs that the city of Charlottetown already has in place and as well did some comparison to peer municipalities in Atlantic Canada and across Canada to identify what did their climate action plans look like, what types of themes and actions and programs are other communities looking at. We also looked at provincial and federal level targets and programs and looked at other communities and uh, potential partners for engagement in future climate action planning, as well as Indigenous and First Nations partners. The background study helped us identify some opportunities to, to leverage through the development of the climate action plan, including existing programs that Charlottetown can continue building on, and helped us identify some common focus areas that are used in other best practice uh, jurisdictions that can be applied to Charlottetown's climate action plan. The background study also helped us identify some, some gaps or places where Charlottetown can, can keep building on its current information and address some gaps as part of the climate action plan. For example, looking at updated uh, data for climate hazards and vulnerabilities to understand what climate related hazards pose the greatest risk and who in the community is most affected. Some other gaps identified, including um, looking for 
a more formal reporting mechanism and funding for climate action moving moving through the three phases of plan development. I'll talk a little bit now about engagement. So the engagement that was conducted as this discovery phase was guided by a project engagement strategy with the aim of ensuring that interested and affected groups were able to give feedback on how the climate action plan should be created and really helping us understand how to make the best climate action plan possible. So the engagement that we did as part of this discovery phase included three surveys, uh, some workshops with city staff and some interviews with key stakeholders groups in the community, totaling over 240 people engaged to provide input on topics like climate related concerns, actions or programs that they're already doing, and to identify some barriers to participating in climate action planning processes so that those might be addressed when the city's climate action plan is developed. Just highlighting some of the key stakeholder groups that we we talked to as part of this process, and these groups were very valuable to the process and provided great input on what they'd like to see in a climate action plan and helped us really reflect a broad range of uh, community in this first kind of pre-engagement phase. And these groups were chosen um, based on being interested in participating uh, that they identified in the survey and then also in, in an attempt to reflect a wide range of organizations in this previous engagement phase. Important to note here as well that uh, as the plan is developed in phase two, there will be lots more opportunities for, for engagement from everyone in the community. And we can talk about that uh, at the end as well. Just to summarize some of the results that we heard through the surveys and interviews, Climate change is definitely of major concern uh, to the community in Charlottetown. We heard concerns about severe weather, storms, erosion, damage to infrastructure, particularly power outages, rising costs related to climate, disproportionate impacts on marginalized populations and people already under stress. But really what we heard was you know, the community is aware that climate change affects all aspects of, of life. Currently, the majority of the community feel that addressing climate change is a role that the government should be leading. And currently, around 50% of, of community respondents identified that the city is addressing climate change issues. So this really highlights an opportunity to build on what's already being done and take it a couple steps further with the climate action plan. Some other findings were that uh, the community feel that they could benefit from additional knowledge or resources to help them address climate change impacts at home or in their lives. We also talked to some city staff and those kind of key stakeholder organizations and around half of our city staff and council respondents indicated that they have currently the, the resources needed to address climate change. So again, adding an opportunity there to build on work done to date and bring more opportunities to help learn and develop actions and programs to help the city address climate change. We have a lot of respondents really active in working on climate change already, even if it's not called climate action. There are a lot of folks in the community that are helping each other prepare or respond to weather related emergencies. We saw this uh, in the event of Fiona, the community coming together and supporting each other. And a lot of that is also, you know, in effect, climate resilience. So there was a lot of climate action already happening in the community, and that's definitely something we want to be aware of and take advantage of in developing the climate action plan. 
last couple results from me. Uh, we also talked to some key stakeholder groups, for example, U University of PEI, Native Council of PEI, BIPOC Usher, about what some of the potential challenges or barriers were to participating in the climate action planning processes. So coming to town halls, answering surveys, giving feedback on climate action plans. What are the barriers to doing that type of work? So some of what we heard was a lack of awareness about the opportunities to have feedback, lack of capacity or funding to participate, and then that sometimes traditional engagement approaches aren't always inclusive of equity deserving groups. So these barriers will be important for us to keep in mind when planning next steps for engagement on the climate action plan. We also asked survey respondents in the community, staff and key stakeholder groups what they feel are important ingredients to make a successful climate action plan. You can see some of them that were answered most frequently on the screen here. We have collaboration, equity, policy, accountability, a few others. And in terms of desired outcomes, what do we want the city and the community to be like once the climate action plan is implemented? What do we want it to achieve? And just some of the, the great answers we heard from the community are shown on the screen here. A cleaner and greener city, more trees, biodiversity and green spaces, safety, health, responsibilities. So all really excellent visions that we can take forward as the climate action plan is developed. Okay, that's all from me. I'm going to turn it over to Jade, who will show you some of the kind of outcomes of this feedback and the guiding principles and focus areas. Thanks, Christina. So with the background policy scan and the what we heard um, process uh, wrapping up, we were able to kind of cross compare the two kind of modules and determine those guiding principles and key themes, um, as well as identify some recommendations and next steps, which is what I will walk you through. So the first thing I'd like to highlight are the guiding principles and the guiding principles are kind of the pillars of the climate action plan. So moving forward into phase two and three of the plan, these five uh, items would be embedded in everything that takes place. Um, so they're not a standalone action. And the first we have um, up on the screen is collaborative and inclusive. And that is to ensure that the plan is developed in a way that it, um, you know, is inclusive, meaning that the city will pr prioritize widespread, accessible, easy and effective community engagement, particularly with a focus on equity deserving groups and Indigenous people. The second item is equity driven and informed, and that is to ensure that the climate change plan integrates a process for shared decision making. It is a community based plan, so it needs to, you know, it's not only the responsibility of the city to carry this forward and, and it needs to empower members of the community, other organizations, upper levels of government, to name a few, to ensure that there is a shared decision making process but also ensure that you're empowering those marginalized populations and prioritize solutions that also help to reduce equity gap across the community. And, and a good example of that is, you know, if you're developing um, homeowner energy retrofit programs to make sure that you're targeting low income as well, to, well as middle income and high income houses so that low income don't end up paying more for their energy costs because the 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 more wealthy have been able to afford to complete those retrofits. So there's a there's an example of how to empower um, equity driven and informed actions. The third pillar is making sure that it's grounded in current science while also um, factoring in indigenous knowledge. As we know, climate science is evolving at a rapid pace and uh, 
the city and the plan will need to ensure that it integrates the most current and highest quality science, while also leveraging um, Indigenous and practitioner knowledge to ensure the decision making that comes from the plan reflects and embraces the entire community. The fourth pillar is action oriented. It's great to have a great vision and words and themes, but at the end of the day, we're successful through good actions. And this plan will leverage past uh, progression and set the stage for future advancements in building resiliency and low carbon and by creating and implementing achievable and impactful actions over the next decade. And the last uh, guiding principle is ambitious. Climate change is not easy. It's complex. It intersects with so many other priorities, if not every other priority that takes place within our communities. And this plan will set the goal and implement action that evolves iteratively towards an ambitious vision for a sustainable future. So with the guiding principles in place, um, the next step is to really break things down into, into focus areas. And through the what we heard process and the background review, uh, the focus areas up on the screen uh, are those that were deemed to be of priority to the city of Charlottetown and, and the greater community. So that includes municipal government, land use planning, buildings and energy, uh, adapted infrastructure, sustainable transportation, community health and emergency response, water and flooding, nature and green infrastructure, and agriculture and resilient food systems. So to go into a little bit more detail, we have municipal government, and this really is um, the roles and responsibility of the city of Charlottetown. And that is as the, the owners of the plan in terms of uh, its decision making, the measuring and reporting progress, but also um, the administrative controls. So making sure that there's a strong steering committee to lead the to lead the development and implemented implementation of the plan and also act as a facilitator to allow for an integrated decision making process. Land use planning, so the way our communities are designed and they function has a huge role in, in adapting to climate change and, and transitioning to a low carbon future. So the city, uh, you know, has a very strong role in this area of focus too. So considerations for integrating um, climate change into land use planning tools uh, and decision processes so that the communities that we build today are ready for the future climate of tomorrow. And getting a little bit more granular on our built infrastructure is um, going from the, the conceptual of the land use down into the buildings and energy. So making sure that we are, are taking considerations to allow homes, build uh, businesses, um, municipal buildings, institutions to be ready for a future climate. And that includes focusing on greenhouse gas reductions, low carbon energy use, and of course, resilient building uh, infrastructure overall. So the next three pillars, um, we'll look at adapted infrastructure. So infrastructure is a broad term, but we mean things like roads, bridges, stormwater systems, lighting, um, making sure that um, you know infrastructure is maintained and replaced to withstand the impacts of a changing climate. But of course, again, supporting that transition to a low carbon uh, community. Sustainable transportation, so it, it, this ties hand in hand with land use, making sure that uh, community design facilitates the use of active transportation. So that is walking, cycling, skateboarding, uh, but also allowing for the transition to a low carbon transportation system through the things of through things like electric vehicles, hydrogen power vehicles and so forth. Another major focus area is community health and emergency response. And I think the community of Charlottetown has had a good taste of this, unfortunately, with some recent severe weather events, but making sure that you know, when a climate event does occur, that the community is ready and able to respond with appropriate emergency response plan planning and is able to provide the resources to support vulnerable and marginalized people 
but also limit exposure um, to people, the impacts of, of climate change. And it's not always just the big extreme events, but sometimes the acute and less noticeable ones, like a, a long spout of hot weather and the impacts that that can have on health and ways that you can uh, look to shelter the community from those types of risks. Next slide. Water and flooding is, has been identified as a key focus. Um, Charlottetown is surrounded by water being a coastal community. Um, so flooding is something of a risk, both uh, riverine and coastal flooding. So seeking ways to, to protect the community from future precipitation and uh, sea level rises, but also seeking ways to protect um, water systems, particularly our drinking water from um, you know, degradation in terms of quality, but also protecting uh, quantity, making sure that we have enough to, to keep the community healthy. Nature and green infrastructure, I have to say this is probably one of my, my favorite areas, but looking at ways, um, it, you know, there's a really interesting relationship when it comes to climate change and the natural environment. The natural environment, particularly trees, are one of the biggest tools that are readily available in our tool belt to address a climate a changing climate. They make us more resilient from things like temperature, but they also play a big role in absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. However, they are also impacted by climate change. You know, we're seeing more diseases and pests, um, you know, the impacts of storms and high heat events. So looking to find ways to protect our natural areas, enhance nature, while also leveraging nature-based solutions will be a key to this climate change plan. And finally, agriculture and resilient food systems. Similar to water, we need food to survive. Food security on an island is, um, while surrounded by our agriculture, it is important to focus on making sure that everybody has access to local healthy food options, even in the event of extreme climate conditions. And in addition, also finding ways to support the local agriculture because they are also feeling directly the impacts of climate change and will need assistance transitioning to become more resilient and also embrace uh, greenhouse gas reduction future. So we have recommendations that have come from the work that has been done to date. Uh, there's recommendations specifically for how to approach phase two and three of the climate adaptation, uh, climate action plan, which is up on the screen. And then there's some recommendations for some gaps that may need to be filled before you actually transition into phase two. So I'm gonna focus right now on recommendations for, for the climate action plan itself. And that includes, uh, you know, before you move, moving into phase two, um, it is recommended that a comprehensive community engagement plan be developed to ensure that two-way dialogue throughout uh, the, the development and implementation of the climate action plan. Also take some time to uh, obtain and analyze future climate data to understand specifically uh, Charlottetown's exposure and hazards to climate change so that you can uh, undertake a climate risk and vulnerability assessment, which allows you to understand specifically the consequences that a climate change have, will have on specific areas of the community to help inform where you need to focus and prioritize actions. From a low carbon perspective, undertaking a community-wide greenhouse gas inventory is important to understand where current and future greenhouse gas emissions and sources and sinks are coming from so that you can develop actions that target the right areas. Speaking of targets, um, you may hear a lot on the news or if you're following different levels of government, there's all these targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You hear a lot about net zero by 2050, 2045. And um, there is, there is a difference between many different jurisdictions. However, our recommendation for the city of Charlottetown is to take a look at the most recent current climate science and set targets um, as it relates to those. And once you have your targets in place, um, you'll start to develop actions. And um, as mentioned previously, it's really important that those actions uh, apply an equity lens, but also leverage different tools um, and are not just, you know, infrastructure based, but they leverage other types of initiatives such as policy programs and education. 
And a plan is only as great as the monitoring of the success. So we have also encouraged or recommend that um, as part of the climate action plan phase two and three, that a monitoring and evaluation framework is developed. So key performance indicators to measure each of the actions and, and, and be able to roll it back up to track progress as it relates to your target. And finally, be accountable and transparent. Share your successes, share your failures. And it's encouraged that uh, that is done through a third party organization uh, to, uh, to promote that accountability and transparency, but also to learn and leverage expertise from other communities and share experiences so that you're not repeating mistakes of, of other um, places around the world. So this is my last slide here. Um, as I mentioned, those are the next steps for the development of the Climate Action Plan. But there are a few steps that will uh, may need to take place between now and the initiation of phase two. And the first being closing the data gaps. There's some information that will be really helpful to help inform the development of the plan, including things like an asset management inventory um, and an examination of the emergency management plan to see where the city sits today. And the second is the development of an implementation team that represents both internal and external representatives to help kind of guide the development of the plan to ensure it reflects the needs of the community and meets the goals of, of achieving a climate resilient and low carbon community. With any big complex initiative like this, I'm there is a need for finances and climate change is not going to be uh, or climate resiliency and climate uh, low carbon communities is not going to be over achieved overnight. So some mechanisms will need to be considered to secure funding both in the short term, mid term and long term to ensure that you are able to achieve the goals that you set out to achieve. And the next stages of the of the plan are phase two and phase three. It's recommended that phase two really focus on strategy and, and engagement, as well as setting the baseline for understanding the community. And that includes the completion of the greenhouse gas inventory and climate risk assessment and setting those targets. And phase three, uh, which is the uh, development of the action plan implementation framework and also outlining the mechanisms for reporting. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your time. And I would like to, to pass it back to Katrina and, and open up the floor for Q, a Q and A. Yes, thank you, Jade and Christina. Um, anybody who has a question, you can feel free to put it in the chat uh, or to unmute yourself and speak. Do you see That's one a, in the chat? Yeah, go ahead, Katrina. Um, yeah, so the question is how long the uh, different stages are expected to take. And, and that's a great question. Um, I guess I have a couple of different answers for that. Uh, you know, one being um, that that's something that I think will come out, you know, we'll take all of this information um, that's been gathered in the first phase and really begin mapping out uh, what the next two phases will look like um, over the coming weeks and months. Um, originally, we had a target of about a year. Um, probably, if I had to guess, it will take a little bit longer than that. But something that I think is important to highlight in terms of the approach that we're planning to take um, is, and it was, uh, there was a quote that spoke very well to it on one of the slides um, from one of the survey respondents, but, um, you know, that the planning process itself is is just as important as the plan and so there's a lot that's accomplished along the way and so because of that um oh so and i see a clarification when we move from planning to action um and i guess what i am i'm moving towards saying is that i see them as intertwined so there's action in the planning um and once we start taking action there's planning in the action so 
um, you know, we're taking action already in the daily work of the Environment and Sustainability Department of the city, um, and we'll continue doing that through the development of this plan in the same ways that we have been and in new ways. Um, and the plan will set new directions um, that we'll begin to take action on. But as we go through those, we'll be revisiting the plan and, and continuing these, these lines of communication. So I understand that that's not a very uh, cut and dry answer, but um, I hope that that provides some clarification. Um, so another question, once the plan is done, what are you thinking about ongoing evolving response to changing circumstances? That's also a great question. Um, I think um, I think all I can really say to it right now is that we recognize that that will be a consideration um, and it will be something that we build in as we we conduct this planning process, um, putting in that monitoring and reporting framework as well, sort of alongside that, um, you know, how we how we keep this a living document um, and and continue to take in not only you know changes within the community but also globally and um, yeah. Okay. Katrina, just to add on a little bit to that mm -hmm. response too, is um, climate action plan has really evolved. It's not something that sits on a shelf anymore. And I think that's through the presentation today. I hope we message that strong and clear around the the importance of identifying the implementation framework so that you don't have to completely redo a plan every five years, um, that it actually becomes in, integrated within in the system. So it's... Uh, you know, with the evolving, rapid evolving of, of of science around the climate change realm, and of course the innovative solutions that are coming onto shelves on a daily basis, it's impossible for for a traditional plan to to keep up with current science. So I think what's really exciting hearing from Katrina and the team at the city is that they don't want a traditional plan. They're looking to find a way that embraces the latest science and the le latest recommendations. So it can just, it's more about how to integrate the decision making into day-to-day -day life so that climate change is always a consideration. Yeah, and Katrina, that. I see another one for you there. Oh, sorry, Christina. Yeah. No, I, I was yeah. just going to offer to field them for you, Katrina. I can read them out so you don't have to scroll mm -hmm. through and answer um, Thank if you. that helps. That so lovely. the next question is, um, given your first answers, how will this work cross over to other departments? Yeah, so um, also a very good question. We see this definitely holistically across the city um, and outside the city too, I mean, within the community and higher levels of government. Um, so as Jade spoke to, one of the recommendations are these sort of working groups, working committees, steering committees, whatever you'd like to call them. So, um, you know, one of, one of those intents would be to pull a committee like that together within city staff, um, having representatives from as many departments as possible, um, really hoping that that can bridge communication between the different departments. Um, another hope is to have, you know, we spoke to the need for this plan to be actionable, um, but I also think that it's important that it identifies who's responsible for different pieces. Um, and so I hope that that combined will, will help for this to spread through the city organization and beyond. Thanks. The next question is around engagement. So the comment says reaching out and actively engaging with the public is not a strong point of the city. Will your group be relying on the city's current engagement system or developing your own? I would encourage the latter, possibly something the city can use as a template. Yeah, I very much hear what you're saying there um, and understand um, the concerns expressed. Um, I guess the short answer is that it will be the latter. Um, you know, we'll be using existing tools that the city does have, our website, our social media, our Charlotte Town Hall engagement platform, but we do plan to take a very different approach to this engagement than has been taken in the past. That's something that will be developed as we put together the engagement plan, but um, our intent is for it to be very rooted in the community, working together with community partners and community members to, you know, really embed this engagement within the community itself and have that two-way dialogue going. I think that's just to build on that briefly, um, as being a part of a lot of the interviews with the, the key stakeholder groups uh, as part of this process, 
highlighted some of those barriers and opportunities to improve engagement around the climate action plan. And, you know, we heard that not everyone um, finds, you know, the traditional methods of engagement accessible or easy to attend or feel comfortable attending. So I think we've already started to build some really good feedback from groups like BIPOC Usher and Native Council of PEI into how to actually meet folks where they are and provide engagement opportunities that maybe are a bit more flexible. Um, and, and that's something that I think can be built into the engagement strategy for, for the Climate Action Plan. Okay, next question. Um, great presentation, thanks for this. How do you see initiatives being prioritized? Hmm. Yeah, I think I'm not sure I have a great answer for that at this point. I think that that's something that will come out of this process. We very much are hoping to tie um, timelines into this and and ranking based on priority. Um, but I don't think that we have developed enough clarity around that at this point for me to give a very comprehensive answer. And I think if I could jump in there too, mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the community and the red is you know the readiness of the community through the development of the plan. There is definitely going to be a prioritization as it relates to funding, um, but sometimes it's also opportunities. And and the one thing about developing a uh, you know more of an implementation framework is the the importance of flexibility. And I think we've seen this. You know, unfortunately, when disasters strike, there tends to be a lot more support and buy-in for those types of disasters post those events. So you want to take advantage of those opportunities to, to, to really push the needle on climate action. The other um, component is, you know, upper levels of government. Sometimes they release funding or they've made commitments to, to certain programs. And so you have to make sure you're flexible and able to pivot so that you can take advantage of those opportunities as they see fit. So I think while there will be a prioritization um, Katrina with the, with the team that there also needs to be some kind of flexibility too so that um, you're always taking advantage of, of opportunities that are beneficial from a taxpayer's perspective but also uh, meet the current very current demands of the community as well. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Jane. Right. Okay next question how is the the climate action plan going to be related to the community energy plan. Is the community energy plan still active and being tracked or reported on? Yes, so the community energy plan is still active um, and being reported on. We anticipate our annual report coming out shortly um, that we'll report on 2022. Um, however, that plan is reaching, kind of reaching the end of its lifespan. Um, it's nearing about five years old um, and it's not, I see that there's an, a tag on there um, if, if about alignment with provincial goals and plans. Um, and, and our CEP, our community energy plan at the moment is um, a bit outdated compared to those provincial goals. So um, I guess I'll just digress a little bit for a second and say that in addition to our community energy plan, we also have an integrated community sustainability plan. So at the moment, those are the two documents that guide our department. Um, the ICSP is already sort of uh, ready for an upgrade. It's it's about a year out of date, um, overdue for an update. And as I said, the CEP is, is nearing that mark. So the intent with the um, Climate Action Plan is to integrate those two plans and to update them and sort of expand beyond them, given um, you know, the new context we find ourselves in um, so many years after their creation. Um, so although both are still currently active and being tracked, um, once this Climate Action Plan is ready, um, that will kind of take the place of both of them. Great. So moving on to a question from Melanie, uh, echoing the comment on engagement. We've just gone through public consultation for the Charlottetown official plan. A big concern is climate change and adaptation. The official plan consultation is being led by another group. Should these things be linked, these two things be linked together? Mm -hmm. Another great question, um, and and again, maybe not a simple answer. I guess the official plan, um, part of the reason that it's being done first, I mean, there's a multitude of reasons 
staffing and funding and those types of things, but also the official plan is meant to be really that overarching uh, document that guides the city's efforts that all other plans fall underneath. So uh, the climate action plan being one of them essentially, um, but also the intent will be for them to inform one another. Um, so the climate action plan will be informed by that official plan, um, but also, you know, official plans can be amended and there's the potential for that feedback to go the other way. I will say that, um, you know, our department has been involved in, uh, to a certain degree, in that official plan um, development, at least with a ability to provide feedback. And, and it is recognized that climate action is, um, is a priority within that and that land use planning is a major um, a major factor within climate action um, but the climate action plan will really sort of take those overarching priorities that are set by the official plan and drill down into them um, you know the official plan although some of some of the recommendations and actions within an official plan are actionable um, because it's setting kind of that overarching vision we need that underlying plan to really guide the concrete steps that we take next if I could provide some assurance that this is very typical of, of municipalities across the country uh, that are in this situation, it's almost impossible to get perfect alignment with all of these plans and, and policies. Um, but the important approach is making sure that things like an official plan is open ended to allow for the interpretation to advance climate change efforts across the across the city. And it does sound like the city is on track for doing that, but it may not have all the specific details that a climate action plan would have. And that isn't a bad thing because an official plan typically sits there for 10 plus years. And I've seen municipalities that have integrated climate change into official plans with some really specific language. And within two or three years, they're doing a complete overhaul of that plan because it's dated information. Um, and that's a real challenge is how do you set steady policy that you know, gets the comfort and buy-in, especially for the development community, because we know development doesn't happen overnight. It takes years, um, while also making sure it can embrace the innovations in, in this space. So if uh, if you're involved as a, as a community stakeholder in the planning process, just keep your eyes and ears open for, for making sure that the language is in there, but it's open-ended enough to be flexible. And I think that's that's just some recommendations coming from from my view from you know similar types of processes across the country thanks next question is for jade um jade do you have any organization in mind for third party reporting uh there are several uh third party reporting programs out there and um, I think once you have the details of the plan, it will really help determine which way you want to go. Um, one that is really all encompassing on both the greenhouse gas uh, reduction and resiliency is the Carbon Disclosure Project, also known as CDP. Um, it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward from a staff perspective to submit on an annual basis, but it's a great benchmarking tool to compare the city of Charlottetown at the community level to cities around the world on their performance of climate change. So that's certainly one. Um, but there's also um, a few uh, programs that are led through the United Nations and C40 City Initiative. Um, there is uh, race to, uh, Cities Race to Zero and Cities Race to Resilient alongside the Global Covenant of Mayors. And they're all standalone programs, but the great thing is, is you can report on all three of them through CDP. So that, that would be kind of right now. But this is definitely a space that is ever evolving um, and something to keep your eyes open for at the federal level is that there is uh, some legislation coming through called the Greenhouse Gas Accountability Act. And uh, there actually may be some prescribed uh, reporting uh, programs that come you know, down through, through the channels, similar to what we've seen in the United Kingdom and New Zealand, where there is um, now a mandatory requirement for municipalities to report through the Task Force of Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. And I'm sorry for the mouthful of the words, uh, but TCFD is the process that is, is mandated in the UK and New Zealand that I have a suspicion May, may come down through the line here in Canada as well. 
I hope that helps. And sorry for beginning so technical. <laughs> okay. Next question. Um, is UPEI a partner in this Faculty of Sustainable Design, Engineering, Island Studies? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, uh, yeah, we uh, we did engage with a number of different departments from UPEI, um, and they participated in the survey um, as well. I believe um, we engaged with the uh, uh, the Climate Change Center in one of the interviews um, that was completed, and and we've had great engagement from UPEI, and intend to to continue those collaborations moving forward with this project. Next one is uh, a comment. Um, the Green Municipal Fund has funding available for studies and plans and execution of projects like this. Thanks, thanks, Valentine. That's helpful. And yeah, definitely some some great funding opportunities out there for for this type of work. Yeah. Hey. Any other questions or comments from from folks? Or from uh, Katrina or Jade? Um, I think, I guess, Christina, maybe if you want to keep an eye out for more questions and I'll just kind of start to slowly wrap up. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here and for all of your engagement tonight and thus far. Um, as was mentioned a few times by Jade and Christina, there is a report being put together with basically these findings, but a little bit more detail. So you can stay tuned for that to come out in the coming weeks. Um, and I will I will send it to um, this this list of emails as well that registered for this. So uh, don't worry about missing that. And it will also go on our um, charlottetownhall.ca slash climate action page, which is our uh, engagement platform for this project. Um, and as you know, this was recorded, so we will get that sent out uh, in the coming days as well. Um, but yeah, I would just encourage all of you to stay tuned for further engagement opportunities. We welcome um, and appreciate your participation. So thank you again. And the Charlottetown Hall is the best place to look 